A Good Man is Hard to Find was written by Flannery O'Connor in 1953. Full disclosure, I love Flannery O'Connor. She's probably my favorite Southern writer. And I don't mean Southern as in she lived in the South when she wrote it. I mean, she tries to capture the South of that time. I grew up in the South, not the Deep South like O'Connor, and some many years after her death, but I still recognize some of the people that I met in my life in these stories. For good or for bad, I met some of these kinds of people in my life. This is the first story I read of hers many, many years ago. Having no idea about her writing, I looked at the title and thought, this is probably some sappy story about a woman struggling to find some good guy to marry. Boy, was I wrong. So I should warn you, this story has a really, really heavy ending. It includes bad things happening to people, kids and adults. The first time I read it, I wasn't even sure I would be able to continue once I realized where the story was going. So if you don't want to hear about sudden life stopping, this video might not be for you. Okay, so let's talk about the story. We have these five characters at the start of the story. The grandmother, the mother, Bailey, the husband of the mother, and son of the grandmother, John Wesley, their eight-year-old son, and June Starr, their daughter. The grandmother and mother are never given names. The family lives in Georgia and are going on vacation to Florida, starting the next day. The grandmother doesn't want to go to Florida, but rather visit some of her friends and family in Tennessee, where she's from. What's very obvious in the first paragraph is the grandmother is selfish and manipulative. She doesn't seem to be very good at the manipulating, but she tries it anyway. We get some foreshadowing right up front when the grandmother tells Bailey that there is this bad guy named the Misfit who's escaped from federal prison and she wouldn't take her kids anywhere near where this guy is. Bailey, who's either used to his mom's manipulations or just annoyed by her, ignores her. So she turns to the mother, Bailey's wife, and now argues that the kids have already been to Florida, and so they should go somewhere else. I don't know, like maybe East Tennessee? Like Bailey, the mother ignores her. O'Connor describes the mother as innocent as cabbage. The handkerchief she is wearing looks like rabbit ears, and oh my goodness, she is wearing pants. She's a modern woman, maybe a little dumb, but what becomes clear is she really has no purpose other than to be a mother. She isn't used to move the story along at all. The astute John Wesley told his grandmother she should stay home if she doesn't want to go to Florida. June Starr responds with an even more astute observation. The grandmother can't stay at home because she needs to be in the middle of the action. The kids are quite rude throughout the story, but in this moment, they have their grandmother's number. The grandmother at first tried to scare June Starr with the misfit. And then when that didn't work, she threatened to not curl her hair the next time the girl wants it curled. This is such a great family. The next morning, the grandmother is in the car before anybody else. This seems like strange behavior for somebody who didn't want to go. Bailey and his wife should be very suspicious of this, but of course they're not. The grandmother is hiding her cat, Pity Singh, in the car. She knows Bailey doesn't want the cat with them, but Granny thinks the cat might die if it doesn't come. Is that really what she thinks, or is this just a way for her to get her way, even if it's a little victory? I thought Pity Singh was an odd name for the pet, and it turns out O'Connor took this from a Gilbert and Sullivan opera called The Mikadoo from 1885. The opera makes fun of the prudishness of Victorian England, much like The Importance of Being Earnest, which is another video I've done. The family in this story reject Granny's old-fashioned ideas of being a lady, so now I kind of see why she used that name. As they get started, we find out that the mother is still wearing pants and a handkerchief that makes her look like a rabbit. But G-Mom is in a beautiful navy blue straw sailor hat with a bunch of white violets on the brim and a navy blue dress with small white dots in print. Boy, what a lady she is. G-Mom tells Bailey not to speed and then points out interesting things in the scenery. This scenery, and maybe the grandmother, annoys John Wesley, so he asks if they could speed through Georgia. Granny and the two kids then have a short discussion about whether they should have love for their home state. G-Mom comments on the kids' rudeness. Agreed, Grandma. But, I mean, Granny, she would probably look in the mirror yourself. 
To further show her old-fashioned ideas, she makes an overtly um, racist statement. Then the grandmother took the baby and played with it. Oh no, if mommy doesn't have the baby, what is she? They pass a graveyard and the grandmother makes reference to the story Gone with the Wind. This is another way for O'Connor to show how stuck she is in the past because she moralizes and romanticizes the plantations of the old. Then there were some mundane things that happened on the ride. You know, we've all experienced those mundane things on long car rides. The grandmother tells the kids about a man named Mr. Edgar Atkins Teagarden, who courted her before she married their grandpa, I'm assuming. His initials were E-A-T. And one day he dropped off a watermelon for her that had his initials carved in it. She said a little boy, calling him something a little bit more, ate the watermelon. I guess this was supposed to be a humorous story, and it did make me chuckle slightly. Sort of. John Wesley thought it was funny, but June Starr didn't. This story shows Granny's obsession with the nostalgia of the past and also kind of shows that she's concerned with things. Thank goodness we're saved from any more of Granny's stories with a stop at the tower for barbecue sandwiches. Ah, now I want a barbecue sandwich. So there's this guy named... Red Sammy Butts. He has this barbecue restaurant. He had these signs up and down the road advertising his place. That kind of advertising reminds me of south of the border on I-95 at the border between North and South Carolina. For some reason, Red Sammy has a monkey tied to a chinaberry tree outside of the restaurant. Red Sammy's wife helps him run the place. She seems to be a waitress there, but not a very good one. And for some reason, June Starr seems to not trust either one of them. You know, I just realized, no adult woman gets a name. Only the children and the men get names. This was probably intentional, but I'm not sure. But it kind of reminds me of how things were in the Old South, the impression that women didn't really have any kind of value. Maybe the reason June Starr has a name is that until she gets married, her value really is in her potential for who she marries. Marrying well usually helped the family as a whole. So it's important for girls to do this. Red Sammy and the grandmother complain about the moral decay of society and how things were better in the past. The irony of complaining about the lack of morality is definitely lost on a man who keeps a monkey tied outside of his restaurant and does whatever he needs to so that he can make as much money as he can. Sort of like Granny who thinks she is better than others because she is a lady even though her behavior does not support her lady title. I guess I should take a minute to explain what I mean by a lady or a southern lady. Many of you might know what this is, but this part is for people who aren't familiar with the South um, or haven't spent a lot of time around elder southern women. The idea of a southern lady came out of the Civil War. It's an idealized idea of women of the South. It really is just another way to control the loss of Southern life as a result of the Civil War, in my opinion. The characteristics of a Southern lady are that they're very charming. They're loyal to their family. They're loyal to their community, which is why the grandmother shows love for Tennessee, which is also why she had a conversation with June Starr and John Wesley about how they should love Georgia. It's also why I've seen t-shirts that say things like Southern by birth, Virginian by the grace of God. They are obedient to their father and to their husbands once they're married. They need a man's protection. Although, that is probably more of a pretending to need a man because when they need to be resourceful, they certainly are. And they're brave. Sort of like Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind when she has to protect the plantation. I guess overall the characteristic of a southern lady is that she is a good woman. So back to the story. Red Sammy and Granny also discuss the misfit. Oh no, that name has come up again. It's clear the family will meet this man at some point. Because they have the same way of thinking, Granny says that Red Sammy is a good man. And he's okay with that assessment. After eating, they head off again. Granny falls asleep but wakes up several times from her snoring. At some point, her snoring woke her up at Tombsbury. Oh, I do not like that name. She tells the family there's an old plantation near there from her younger days. Okay, so she's back to trying to get her way in where they go. 
She starts telling them how wonderful the house is, but she knows Bailey won't go there, so she makes up this story about a hidden treasure to get the kids to force Bailey to veer off of their chosen path, even if for just a little bit. Her manipulation actually worked, and the kids hounded Bailey until he relented. They barreled down a rough road and seemed to drive for way longer than Granny said that it should be. Eventually, Bailey started considering turning around. About this time, Granny had a realization that the house she was thinking of was in Tennessee. Suddenly, Pity Singh jumps from the basket and landed on Bailey's shoulders. As you can imagine, chaos ensued, and unfortunately, the car went off the road and rolled into a ditch. Somehow, most everyone was okay. The mother had a broken shoulder, but more importantly, the grandmother's hat may be ruined. Oh my, how is anybody going to know she's a lady now? The grandmother actually hoped that she was injured so that Bailey wouldn't get mad at her, you know, for causing the accident. At least she sees her culpability in this. June Star is actually a little disappointed nobody died. Give it time, June Star. Luckily for them, a car came down the road. Unlucky for them, it's the misfit. They're in a hearse-like vehicle. That does not sound good. The family doesn't know who these men are, and the kids excitedly tell them they had an accident. The grandmother, unable to tell the truth on anything, tells them that the car flipped twice. The misfit corrected her because he saw it happen. O'Connor gives us a little foreshadowing and imagery with the description of the woods behind the ditch in which the family is sitting. She wrote, Behind them, the line of woods gaped like a dark, open mouth. The misfit tells the mother to get control of the kids. He doesn't like kids. With these kids, I don't really blame him. They might have been able to get out of this situation alive. Probably not, but maybe. Until the grandmother jumps up and announces she knows who he is. Oh, good grief. Why can't she just think before she does or says things? The misfit tells her things would have been better had she not recognized him. Bailey tries to take control of the situation for the family, but Granny won't let him. She immediately starts her manipulation behavior by saying he wouldn't shoot a lady. Wait, what about the rest of the family, Granny? Then she tries to tell him he's a good man and must have come from a good family, but he doesn't bite. The misfit is with two other men, Hiram and Bobby Lee. The misfit is the only male who doesn't get a name. It could be because he's not really considered a traditional Southern male. Hiram and Bobby Lee are bad, but they're followers. The misfit controls them. And so this puts him on a higher level of bad. Like, too bad for what would be considered a good Southern person, I guess. He orders Hiram and Bobby Lee to take Bailey and John Wesley to the woods, you know, so they can ask him a question. The grandmother tries to adjust her hat, but it falls apart in her hands. Well, there goes the illusion of being a lady then. Bailey is weak, but not stupid, and he knows what's going to happen. He can barely hold himself up as he leans on a tree when he looks back to tell his mom he would be right back. He calls her mama. This is probably the first time he shows any emotion towards her. I get saying something to your mom, but what about your wife and kids? And also, the grandmother tells him to come back as if he has a choice, but the mother says nothing. Again, Granny tries the whole, you're a good man manipulation. He disagrees and says he was put in prison because he did what they said he did. The problem with this tactic is he had a bad childhood and he eventually killed his dad for it. Though he seems to have allowed himself to believe his dad died differently so that he can deal with the horror he perpetrated. He also disagrees with Granny that he's a good man. Finally, the mother asks where they're taking Bailey and John Wesley. The grandmother continues to be polite to him and offers him one of Bailey's shirts after he apologizes for being shirtless around the ladies. It's odd that he has a wholly amoral look on life, yet he still accepts some of society's rules, like being properly clothed around mixed company. Okay, so since the whole you're a good man tactic isn't working, now she tries to convince him that he could be a good man. He said no, and then there were two shots from the woods. All that foreshadowing has brought us to this point. What the grandmother doesn't get is that the misfit doesn't want to be good. 
You can see it in how easy it is for him to order Bailey and John Wesley's demise and how he looks directly at mo the mother and June Starr when he says that he's seen a woman flogged. Boy, I bet that would have brought a chill down their spines. The grandmother starts trying to convince him to pray and using religion as an argument on him. This argument doesn't work on him either, though Granny seems to think maybe she's getting through to him. The misfit tells us he doesn't remember why he was put in prison, but he believes his punishment was far more than it should have been. Just like how the family's getting harsh punishment for their selfishness and hypocrisy, or at least Granny's hypocrisy. He sees no point in praying or asking for God's forgiveness. He thinks people get punished no matter what. Then the misfit sends the mother, baby, and June Starr with Hiram and Bobby Lee. He orders Bobby Lee to hold June Starr's hand. June Starr seems to be unaware of the situation and continues her rude behavior by saying she didn't want to hold his hand because he looks like a pig. Now G-Mom is alone with the misfit. Suddenly she seems speechless. All she can do is pray, Jesus, Jesus. The misfit mistakes this as cursing. He somehow compares himself to Jesus. Jesus was punished for all of man's sins, and the misfit was punished for sins he can't remember doing. Oh yeah, I can see that comparison. Can't you? He calls himself the misfit because he can't make what he's done fit with his punishment. Suddenly, there's a piercing scream and a shot. At the same time, the misfit asks Granny, Does it seem right to you, lady, that one is punished a heap and another ain't punished at all? Boy, what a statement. Let that sink in. The misfit has already picked up on who Granny is and her sins, but who just got punished? Okay, now Granny is very frightened. She starts quickly talking and using the same arguments that haven't worked. He comes from good people. He won't shoot a lady. He can be reformed through Christ, and he needs to pray. Desperate, she's given up and goes to what she thinks is his idea of fair and offers to give him all of her money. His response is curious. There never was a body that gave the undertaker a tip. Her offer of money seems to imply that he doesn't send people to the undertaker for money, and so maybe he'll give up on the idea if he gets enough money. The problem is that she, once again, misunderstands him and his worldview. He doesn't believe in an afterlife, so he doesn't see sending people to the undertaker as a crime. Then two more shots rang out. Granny yells, Bailey boy, Bailey boy. Is this really the first time she hears the shots and realizes what's happening? I mean, we all know Bailey left a long time ago. The misfit didn't miss a beat in the conversation from the shots. It's almost like he didn't hear them or didn't care. He tells G-Mom, if Jesus did what he said, then we must all follow him. However, if he didn't do what he said, then we should all do whatever we want and enjoy the time we have. He says there's no pleasure but meanness. This is completely opposite of everything G-Mom believes. She sees that everything she believes in is being destroyed by meanness or violence. She's spiraling at this point, which is why she says maybe he didn't raise the dead. Finally, Granny seems to realize what's going on. I mean, she knew it before, but at that time, she could be distracted by family infighting and her desire for self-preservation. But those distractions are gone, so now she finally seems to see that the misfit has no interest in being a good man. He actually seems to want to be anything but a good man. She's finally moved away from her own selfishness and accepts the love that she has for her family. In light of her own mortality, she's beginning to accept her fate and embrace it. The misfit says he wishes he'd been there so he could see Jesus raise the dead. And when he said this, his voice cracked and he looked like he might cry. Looking at him, this clears the grandma's head and she looks at the misfit and says that he is one of her own children and touches his shoulder. This is her moment of grace. Having come to see the love she had for her family, she's now treating the misfit as her son and forgiving him for what he's about to do to her. This startles the misfit and he jumps back like he's been bitten by a snake and then he fires three shots into her chest. To show he doesn't care about the horrors that he's done to people, he immediately cleans his glasses. No pause, no moment of reflection. When the grandmother fell, quote, her legs crossed under her like a child's and her face smiling up at the cloudless sky, end quote. This is quintessential O'Connor. Her characters always find their moment of grace, but it almost always ends badly for them. The grandmother had her moment of grace when she reached out to the misfit, 
Unlike all the other times where she talked to him simply for her own selfish needs, this moment was for a holy kind of love. Finally, she received her punishment, not for her selfishness or her hypocrisy, but for her show of true faith and selfish love. When Hiram and Bobby Lee return and see the grandmother, Bobby Lee commented about her being a talker, to which the misfit said, quote, she would have been a good woman if it had been somebody there to shoot her every minute of her life. Man, the misfit is definitely an astute person. He saw right through her and saw that only violence could bring her to genuine goodness. 